Happy New Year. My name is Mariah. We're so happy that you're with us this morning. It says um, in, a, in Ephesians 4, verses 22 through 24, it says, Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So, Jesus, we just thank you um, that by your spirit you are making us more and more like you. So, Lord, as we think of this new year, we just ask that you would renew our thoughts and our attitudes. We want more of your spirit. It also says in 2 Corinthians that you are making us more and more like you. So, Jesus, we are just open to whatever you are calling us to this year. We are open and ready for more of your spirit to transform us and make us more like you. Um, Would you show us more of your love this year? Would our relationship with you grow? And would we just go deeper and deeper with you? And Jesus, we also just want to thank you so much that no matter what happens this next year, um, we have you to cling to, our firm foundation, our strong, trustworthy hope. We thank you, Lord, that you are so faithful. We pray this in your name. Amen.
Let's pray. We were beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're set free. Lord, we thank you for coming and inviting us to be with you. Not from afar, not from your throne, but you came to our living room. You came to our house. You came to our mess to show us that you love us. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your kindness. And we thank you, Lord, that you are here. Continue to speak to us, to make us more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, Happy New Year's Eve. Hope you had a wonderful Christmas with your loved ones, with your family. And um, I'm Sammy Gondola. I'm one of the pastors here um, in charge of missions. Um, and it's, uh, it's awesome to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen? Full house. Love it. You guys look great. Just three weeks ago, I landed in the city of Kasice in the Republic of Slovakia in Eastern Europe for the first time ever. Pastor Marek picked us up at the airport. And towards the end of the journey, where we were going to his city, he said, before I take you to the hotel, I would like, you to, I would like to drive through the, the settlement, uh, the Roma settlement, close to our church, so you can see where the people that we minister to live. And I was like, hey, that's awesome. That's beautiful. I'm all for that. We'd love to see that. And it was snowing, and we're driving through the town, and I'm checking all the beautiful buildings and all the beautiful houses. And, uh, and suddenly, Pastor Marek, who is Roma too, starts driving out of town a little bit. And that's where the stark difference started. Now, I heard of the stories of how the Roma people, or the gypsies, as they're com commonly known, how they're called and how they're treated in Europe, and pretty much wherever they are, for that matter, and how they are outcast in society and viewed as lower class. But one thing is to hear about it, and another thing is to see it with your own eyes. Now, just to give a little context, the Roma, there was something called the Roma Holocaust that is not talked about, it's kind of forgotten in history. So the Roma or the Gypsies was one of the social groups that were viewed as racially inferior. They were the social outcasts of society. And they were viewed like that by the Nazis. During 1935, starting 1935 to 1945, the end of the war, along with the Jews, they were persecuted, imprisoned in concentration camps. And subsequently, approximately one to one, to one and a half to two million Roma men, women, and children were slaughtered by the Nazis. So that legacy of racism and prejudice, that, that dark history still felt in all over Europe. So we're sl driving, you're slowly driving through this village and I took maybe like three pictures because I, I didn't want to appear like your regular tourist, you know, and I wanted to be in the moment. And I'm just seeing, like, I just drove through the village. There's just beautiful buildings, nice houses. And these people are at the edge of town, pushed out. 
small shacks right next to each other. It was cold. It was colder than Minnesota. Can you imagine? Like, I, I go on mission trips, different parts of the world. It's usually warmer. And it's like, this is colder than Minnesota. What am I doing here? There's, there's something wrong with that. But I see little, just like the little houses, the smoke coming out on each uh, rooftop because it's really hard for them to get jobs and the government doesn't provide heating systems, so they burn wood all winter long. And I was feeling just a sense of indignation. You know, I was just like, oh, I was getting mad. Why do people have to live like this? Why do they have to live like this? Then all of a sudden, there's this teenager that just runs to our car and he's like, brothers, brothers, hey, listen to the, to, the, to the verse that I just memorized. And then he just recited it in his language and the pastor, pastor Maricus, he speaks English, so he's translating for, that, for us. And he's like, hey, this, I, I'm just so excited that you're here. And then another guy comes up and he's just big smile. He's like, welcome to our village. God is good. And another person, and another person, and then it hit me that this is exactly the place that Jesus would live at. These are the kind of people that he would hang out with. And actually, that's exactly what he did, didn't he? And I was like, do you know, Jesus is here too. He came down to earth to our mess to live among us then I realized that this poor settlement, this little village, was like the, a microcosm of humanity as a whole. And like Pastor Joe said on Christmas Eve, Jesus came to this world not as he wanted, or not as he wanted it, but he came anyway. When the Son of God took on flesh he, and, and chose to be born, he was born in a poor, small town of Bethlehem, and he grows up in Nazareth. Nothing special. Like Chad said recently, Nazareth, Nazareth was a, a hick town. <laughs> Jesus had an accent. You know, I love that because I have an accent. I think that's really cool. You have an accent too, by the way. Uh, <laughs> you know? I can't even imitate it anymore. Um, uh, so when, he, when it's time to, to, for him to start his public ministry, Jesus doesn't start in Jerusalem, you know, the, the Jewish capital of, uh, of, of the world. And he goes there eventually. Or to Egypt or to, the, or to Greece where the big philosophers he think he goes into Galilee. He chooses Galilee. And it's like Galilee is a predominantly fishing region in northern Israel. The last place in the world that you would choose to start your public ministry of redeeming humanity. The last place in the world. But that's how God operates. He loves doing the unexpected. 1 Corinthians 1, 27, 29 says that instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world, what is viewed as nothing, to bring to nothing what is viewed as something, so that no one may boast in his presence. So that he gets all the glory and all the credit. We're in the book of Matthew. And in the preceding chapters, we learn about Jesus being baptized by um, John the Baptist. The heavens open. God the Father speaks. This is my son, my son, whom I'm, I'm, I'm well pleased. Then the Holy Spirit lands on him as a dove. It's an amazing moment of glory, and it's just awesome. God's seal of approval on Jesus is seen and heard. And after that huge moment, the pinnacle, boom, Jesus is led 
by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil, he gets a huge test. 40 days and 40 nights. But he resists the devil and he passes the test. So we jump into the story when Jesus is about to start his public ministry. And he starts assembling his disciples. His inner circle. The guys that, are going to spend, that he's going to spend most concentrated time with. And he's going to say, follow me. And he's going to teach them how to live for God and how to love people. All people, Jews and Gentiles. Matthew 4, 12, we're going to go to 16. When he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. So due to the gathering storm happening around John being arrested, I believe the Holy Spirit took him to Galilee to protect him because his time hadn't come yet. He was just getting started. He left Nazareth, where he grew up, and went to live in Capernaum, a town in Galilee, by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. And this was written about 700 years before Jesus. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, along the road by the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. Galilee of the Gentiles. That's important. The people who live in darkness have seen a great light. And for those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And what a great light they're about to see. Galilee is very important, as we will, and as we will continue in the book of Matthew reading and all, all the Gospels, you will see that the region of Galilee is where Jesus kind of made, makes like his headquarters. That's where he lived, and while important events occurred in Jerusalem, the Lord spent most of the three years of his ministry along the shores of this fresh water lake. Some amazing things happen in this place. And this was actually foretold. Verse 17. From then on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Mark 1.15 says it like this. The time is fulfilled, Jesus is saying, and the kingdom of God has come near. So repent and believe the good news. Jesus continues building on John's message, calling people to repentance and turning to God. But how did this message, just think about this, how did this message of the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is here land in the ears of the people of Galilee? They've been waiting for this. For hundreds of years. If you grew up in the synagogue. Or if you've been around Jewish people. You, you are familiar with this language. This is not for us. It might have been. But for them. It's like. Okay. What? I, are you serious? You probably read the prophecies. That at some point, And at some appointed time. The, the promised one, the Messiah, will come and establish his kingdom on earth. And of the hundreds of prophecies, there are literally hundreds in the Old Testament about the Messiah, they probably, most likely, even know by memory this one from Isaiah 61. Messiah is the Messiah's Jubilee. It says, the spirit of the Lord God is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So they're like, could this be the one? Could this be the time? 
the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is here. But the message comes with a strong call. Repent. Repent. And believe the good news. Sometimes this word repent feels kind of scary and just kind of like, oh, my goodness. And as I'm reading this and I'm studying and just Lord speak to me, I just had a sense and I just, just really believe that this is an invitation. This is an invitation to a new life. To change your mind and your, your way of thinking, to, of thinking, to leave your old life behind and turn to God and be transformed to his image. What a gift. Repent. Come back to me, says the Lord. Yes, we live under Roman rule. But that's not your biggest problem. That kingdom will fall eventually. I'll make everything right. But that I came here to do something way, way bigger than that. Your biggest problem, Israel, Jews and Gentiles alike, we need to put ourselves in this crowd. That is, your hearts and souls are captive by sin. And the time has come for you to be free, to be free for real, like for real, to be free in your heart. The king that you've been waiting for is here, and he wants to have a close relationship with you. That's the message. That's the invitation. I remember when I accepted that invitation. You see, I grew up in the church, and as I said before, you probably heard this before, the son of a pastor, very beloved, very well-known, Marcelo Gondola, and my mom, Jean, who's a high school uh, teacher in Panama City, Panama, not Florida, Panama. Uh, <laughs> and I repeated the prayer to accept Jesus when I was five, and uh, we lived in a parsonage, like a little house in the back of the church. It was attached to the church. And uh, that's when my, st my dad started showing Christian movies at our church first. And then it just went all over the nation. Um, but it was like the first time. And there was this movie called El Infierno Ardiente, and which, which means uh, the burning hell. And it wasn't supposed to be for kids. <laughs> it was like rated R back in the 70s and 80s. I watch it now, it's super cheesy, but back then it was like terrifying. It's like, oh my gosh. And I snuck in to the church five years old, like, blah, 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 and I'm watching this. Thing. I'm like, oh my, like, I don't want to go to hell. Ah! And, my, and I, I, my brother Danny and I, um, I'm the youngest of three, two older brothers. And my brother Danny and I went to, to my mom, to our mom, just like, like, we want to say the prayer. We want to accept Jesus. We don't want to go to hell. <laughs> and my mom was like, okay, I'll, I'll lead you to the prayer. And um, to accept Jesus when I was five, got baptized when I was 12, in a river in Panama City. And, and I was on fire for God and got baptized. Wow, yes. And then I, early teenage years, started getting really rebellious and I, because I hated being like under the shadow of being the son of a pastor and have to be behave. And when I did something wrong, people would be like, hey, but you're, aren't you the son of the pastor, blah, 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 blah. It's like, ah, and you know, don't do that to kids, okay? Especially pastor's kids and kids that are trying to figure things out, don't do that. Um, and I, I want, because I, I felt sheltered and I wanted to just kind of experience the world. And so I would just go to church to please my parents, but I was living a worldly lifestyle with my friends and my neighbors and kids from school. But everything changed one afternoon when, uh, my, when I was 16. My first girlfriend left me to be with another guy. <laughs> I know, what a terrible mistake she made. <laughs> Look at all she's missing now, right? Um, and I was alone at home 
And, I was, and we had an old piano, and, we, and I was playing, and I was crying, and I was just all heart, broken hearted, and I was like, ay, 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 ay. <laughs> Por qué me dejaste? Why did you leave me? You know, and, um, and, uh, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I heard God's voice in my heart, 16 years old, say, Sammy, ¿por qué estás llorando? You know, Jesus speaks Spanish, right? <laughs> so, ¿por qué estás llorando? Why are you crying? <clears throat> and this was a moment, I just felt in my heart, he spoke to my heart, he says, see how you feel rejected? Just imagine how I feel when you reject me, knowing that I gave my life for you, gave everything for you. At that moment, something broke in my heart. And I was like, I'm so sorry, lo siento, Señor. I went to the ground and I sobbed. I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Thank you for dying for me on the cross. I repent. I give you my life. My life is yours, Lord. And it's beautiful how God used that breakup to wake my soul and to open my eyes and to reveal himself to me. Jesus is saying, come, be forgiven of your sins and become a citizen of the kingdom of God. And did you know that no matter what nationality you're from, if you're American, if you're Panamanian, if you're from Spain, if you're Mexican, if you're from Mozambique, if you're from France, wherever you're from, if you belong to the King of Kings, Jesus, you take a new citizenship, a new citizenship. Philippians 3.20 says that our citizenship is in heaven, which means that we now have a new identity, a new identity. We don't belong to this world anymore. We belong to him. Peter 2, 11 says that we are, and I love this translation, we are temporary residents and foreigners in this land. And I know a thing or two about going from one citizenship and taking another citizenship. I was born and raised in Panama, and I came to the States uh, back in 99 as an international student to go to college. And I came with a Panamanian passport. It's my Panamanian passport. I was a lot younger back then. <laughs> and thinner. Thanks to all the uh, great food from the Midwest. Yeah. I graduated from college. I got married to my lovely wife, Billy, of 20 years as, as of last Wednesday. Woo! <laughs> woo woo! And we have three beautiful children, Evelyn Jackson and Talia. And I got a work permit, and then I got a green card, a permanent residency card. Then finally, and for many years, I lived here, worked here, did ministry here. But as a resident, I wasn't a citizen. It's not automatic. People don't get that confused. Like, well, you're married to, you know, like you're here, you pay taxes, not, you know. It's, it's, a, it's a process, okay? It's a process. And finally, in 2018, after two years of a process with immigration, and I jumped through all the hoops, paid the fees, filled out the forms, submitted five years of taxes, interviews, fingerprints, pictures, FBI background check. The FBI has everything on me. I can't do anything wrong. <laughs> Study for the 100 questions uh, for the citizenship test, which is, I was terrified, and I studied, and I studied every, every night for like, a, for two months, I studied for that test, because I did not want to fail that. And then, and I passed with flying colors, yeah, yeah. Um, all the questions. And then you wait, and then you wait for the letter to, to say like, hey, you passed the test, and then this is the date, and you go to Minneapolis to the court, to the immigration court, to take the oath of allegiance to the United States of America and become a US citizen. It's a big deal. But this is not your grandpa's pledge of allegiance. 
to become a citizen of the United States if you're not born here, as it should be. Let me read you, read you the naturalization oath of allegiance of the United States of America to become a citizen. With people from all over the world, Steve Baumgart was there, it was awesome. And my wife, and I, I didn't know that I could invite more people. I thought you can bring like, you know, family, a few friends, or like a couple friends, but like you could, I could have invited a lot of people, but there were people from all over the world and taking the oath and we stood up and it was very emotional. And after all these years, I get to become a citizen of the United States. Something that many, many, many people will kill to get and are trying to get to this country and to be a part. And I had the privilege and I felt so honored and so humbled. And here is the oath. Hereby I declare an oath that I absolutely and entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, potentiate, state, or government of whom, of which I have herefore been a subject or citizen, that I will support and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I will bear arms on behalf of the United States when required by the law, that I will perform non-combatant service in the armed forces of the United States when required by the law, that I will perform work of national, I'm, I'm getting goosebumps. And I'm, I'm thinking of the moment, of this moment, and I, that I will perform work of national importance under civilian direction when required by the law, and that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, so help me God. <laughs> yes. Then and only then, I officially was officially adopted into the American family. I'm proud to be Panamanian, and I'm also proud to be an American citizen. And that is all good. I believe God is all good with being patriotic, but within the right place. Give to Caesar what is to Caesar, and to God what is God. Now I have a new passport the U.S. passport. But this American citizenship, even though it's great and I'm very grateful, pales in comparison to being a citizen of the kingdom of God, the king of all kings. The, we pledge allegiance ultimately to him and him alone. And it's an honor to be an ambassador of the kingdom of God on this earth. That's our allegiance. That's our allegiance. Never forget that church. We, we don't belong to this kingdom. We don't belong to this world. It's great to be American. It's great to be, to, uh, to be a citizen. It's awesome. We fulfill our duty. But at the end of the day, we can't forget that that is secondary. That is secondary. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven of the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. 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 The kingdom of God is here, and we've been invited to be a part of it. And talking about invitations, let's keep reading. Chapter 8, I mean, verse 18. The first disciples, as, as, as he was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. We're introduced to these guys now. Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there... He saw two brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, I love that name, Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in the boat with Zebedee, their father, preparing their nets, and he called them. Immediately also, they left the boat, and their father 
and followed him. Now, when Jesus called these guys, he didn't say, I'm calling you to be a pastor or a teacher or an evangelist or a missionary or an apostle. Also notice that Jesus doesn't ask for credentials. It's not like, hey, do you follow the law? What, what, uh, what tribe are you guys from? Like, none of that. Jesus knew who they were and what they were capable of, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. He simply said, follow me. Come hang out with me. I want to spend time with you. I want to spend time with you. Be around me. Go to the places I go to. Hang out with the people I hang out with. I will show you how to fish for people. They didn't know exactly the implications of that call. They didn't know what that meant, follow me completely. They just simply obeyed and they followed. They left everything behind. They were in the middle of their workplace. They were not just like hanging out. They were in the middle of their business. And it says that James and John literally left their dad. They left their father. Boom, hey dad, see you later. I'm going to go with this guy. I hope everything goes okay. I hope the business goes well. I'm just going to follow Jesus. And Galilee was their, their hometown, their home place. They had relatives there. They had friends. They, you can imagine the people that knew them when they, were, when they saw them walking with Jesus, with this prophet from Nazareth. They were like, like hey, guys, like, like, what are you, like, what are you guys doing? Like, aren't you fishermen? Like, what are you guys doing walking with this guy? Your dad is calling you. Your dad is waiting for you. He needs help. And one of them would just be like, um, we fish people now. <laughs> and the neighbor would be like, um, okay. <laughs> like, this is weird. It's crazy. Just think about that. We read it in the Bible. And we're like, oh, they just followed him. Oh, how awesome. And I bet they had pressure to be like, hey, guys, need to go back to the boat. They left every, everything behind and they followed him. And there is a cost to follow Jesus. There is a cost. Now, there was another pivotal moment in my life when I made a more serious commitment to following Jesus. I was like, I was 19, had a, just a great group of friends in our church and there was a conference, we heard about a conference in San Jose, Costa Rica, and there was like 50 of us, we got in a big bus, drove like 18 hours from Panama City to San Jose. This conference was put on by YWAM, Youth with a Mission. I don't even know what YWAM was, Youth with, Youth with a Mission, back then, but it was for the whole region of Central, South America, the Caribbean, and, um, and it, was, it was a great conference and everything, but there was something, the Lord has been working in my heart and I just was sensing a call to just be more committed and more serious with God and his calling. And um, it was the last night. There was a, this conference speaker was speaking. And I, I can't remember what he was saying. Like, I don't remember the message. Like, most of you won't, won't remember this tomorrow. <laughs> and I was just like, what? But he said at the end, he said, like, I, I, before, I, before I stop, like, I just feel like God has a special call to some of you here. There's like 2,000 students, I mean, youth, young people there. And it's like, God has a special call that he wants to call some of you to make a, a, a stronger con commitment to the Lord. And, but he said, before you, before you stand up, just take the, just wait and take, think about this very seriously. Because the Lord is going to take your yes very seriously and i was ready i felt like my seat was on fire i was like yes lord here i am sent me sent me and then everything changed god there's a long story i don't have the time but god guided my path into different places different things started to show me his his direction for my life. And we, and I've had ups and downs and, and many battles and doubts and, and despite all my mistakes and still 
he wants me and he still calls me and he calls you too and he has a purpose for your life too. And we fast forward 27 years. I get a call from my brother Danny that, um, and this is July this year, that my mom had a terrible stroke. She's 83. And that I, if I could, to fly down to Panama in emergency, it's like, oh my goodness, no. I fly down to Panama to see her, spend like 10 days there, was able to, to see her at the, at the hospital, and it was terrible. She, it was bad. It was really bad. Horrible condition. I didn't know if she understood what I was saying, if she could see me. Like, I would get in front of her face, and I was like, Mom, it's me, Sammy, I'm here. Nothing. It was the hardest thing I've ever experienced, to see my mom like that. And I, this is Panama, third world country, eight beds in a room, no curtains, there's family, everything is exposed, everything is open, and I didn't care, and I was just like, Mom, I love you, I love you. And I was like trying to see if you could understand. And the only thing she said to me that whole time, and the last thing she said to me was, I love you too, with a lot of effort. And it was all in English. My mom was an English teacher. I said, I love you, mom. I love you. And she said, I love you too. I returned home because we didn't know how long she was going to last. And I um, felt like I needed to go back and get ready for the Mozambique trip. And I wasn't sure um, if I should go or not to Mozambique. Then I get the call that she sent home just to pass. There was nothing they could do. And I called Danny again and I said, like, hey, what do you think? Should I, should I go, um, go back? And, and I was praying and I'm like, should I go back to be with her and my brothers? And, and I really believe Danny, God spoke through Danny and, and said like, hey, you said your goodbye. Go do what God called you to do. It's okay. So as we go, and I decided to go with the team, amazing team, we're in Qatar waiting for the flight to Mozambique, and I get the call that my mom went to be with the Lord. And I'm going to tell you that verse that says that the peace that surpasses all our understanding became real like never before. I was shocked, but at the same time, I had a, such a beautiful and amazing strength from the Lord in that moment. We continue with the trip. We got to Mozambique, and um, we part of the trip was to go and be a part of the dedication of the, of the building of the new uh, high school that we helped with a lot of effort and being obedient with the Lord helped provide the funds to um, and I'm waiting to speak on behalf of you guys. That's one of the things I love about what I do is that I get to be an ambassador of the kingdom, I be, be an ambassador of PV, of the Lord, and just to give some words of, hey, greetings from PV, we're, it's amazing. And they did, they threw an amazing ceremony. I've never seen anything like that. They were so thankful for Pleasant Valley. They were so thankful for the Lord to provide for this building. And as I'm waiting, to go up to speak. The Lord reminded me that when people, would, and I, you know, I'm the baby of the family, and I'm the one, the only one that left home. My two brothers are still in Panama, and um, the Lord reminded me that when my, people would ask my mom, like, hey, like, do you, do you miss Sammy? Do you miss that, you know, uh, that, that he left and, and he's in the, in the state so far away? And my mom would always say to people, she was a strong, strong woman of God. Say, I do miss him, but I dedicated him to Jesus when he was a baby. To capture his heart and to serve him wherever he calls him. And I'm so proud of him that he's serving the Lord. That, that fills me with joy. And the voice of the Lord in my heart is like, this is why you're here. This is why you're here. She's with me. 
she's with me. I'll give you the strength to keep going and do what I call you to do. I'm with you. I know I'm not alone. I know that in this room, so many of us, many of you have lost loved ones. And, and especially this season can be hard because um, we don't have our loved ones with us anymore. But we need to, to continue having a, an eternal perspective and knowing that this is not the end and this is not our home. Amen. 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 I finished the trip, flew back to Panama for the funeral. It was a great celebration. And there's a cost to following Jesus, but it's absolutely worth it because he is worth it. Let's continue. Verse 23. Now Jesus began to go all over Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease. It, just think about that. Every disease and sickness among the people. Then the news about him, about him spread, of course. I mean, <laughs> this doesn't happen every day. Okay, this doesn't happen every day. So this news, the news of, of, of Jesus started spreading throughout Syria. So they brought to him all those who were afflicted, those suffering from various diseases and intense pains, the demon possessed, even demonic oppression, the epileptics, and the paralytics. Paralytics. Where did that accent come from? Paralytics. Paralytics. There you go. Uh, and he healed them. <laughs> Large crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. So what a crowd, right? This is ER central. There's a sea of sick people. And as Jesus is preaching and teaching, just put yourself in that crowd and you could hear, I could hear the groans of pain and the people walking like this. And the blind, and the, in the presence of Jesus, disease, affliction, pain, demonic oppression. I could even hear demons being like in the crowd. They're like, oh, stop, stop, Jesus. Don't say that anymore. I can tell you stories. I've experienced some of that demonic stuff and seen people being delivered. It's amazing. By the power of the only one. Jesus Christ. And I can just imagine the scene. Jesus is preaching and he's like, you get healed and you get healed and you stand up and stop walking. You open your eyes and start seeing. You demons, get out of here. You don't belong here. Just an amazing scene. And this is easy stuff for Jesus. This is easy. This is nothing. He's just being the son of God on this earth and the fulfillment of God's promise. And when I see, when I read this account, is that Jesus takes care of people. He takes care of people. He gets close. He touches them. He sees them. And he shows compassion, not only to his own people, the Jews, but to all people, Jews and Gentiles, regardless of where they're from. He goes to where they are. And wasn't that the original promise that God made to Abraham back in Genesis? That all the nations of the earth will be blessed by your offspring. And now we're witnessing the fulfillment of that promise in full display. And I just love how these guys, his disciples, get to experience this with Jesus. At the end of the day, that's the, the biggest takeaway. They get to experience this. With Jesus, because they took the risk to get out of that boat and follow him. It's about the relationship, the miracles that's easy for God, that's easy for Jesus. It's a relationship. They got to walk with him, travel with him, meet with people, touch people, ask people, hey, what is your, what is your, your illness? Like, okay, let me, let, he's, he's preaching right now, but just, Wait here and they're out. Like they were part of that. 
It was awesome. And can you imagine what's going on through the minds of these two sets of siblings, these professional fishermen? A few weeks ago, they were on a boat on the Sea of Galilee, gathering fish, fishing, and now they're seeing unbelievable miracles that have never been seen before. All the crowds and all the people coming from all over the world and all over the place. And I can imagine just uh, Peter turns, turns to his brother Andrew. He said, like, hey, Andrew, I guess this is a little bit more exciting than just gathering fish on the sea. And Andrew will turn and he says, I'm just so glad I got out of that boat. I'm just so glad. Aren't you glad you got out of that boat? I'm glad I got out of that boat. And if you're still on that boat, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Jesus is calling you. He's calling you too. To follow me. Follow me. Be with me. Don't worry about the other stuff. Just follow me. 500 years ago, and I'm going to end with this. The Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés, 500 years ago, he sails with 500 soldiers from Havana, Cuba, in 11 ships towards the Mexican coast to capture Mexico, to, to defeat the Aztec Empire. So it's a huge empire, powerful. And as they get to the, the shore of Mexico, the soldiers started to get worried and there was like a mutiny and they were just like, man, like we don't want to go through this thick, thick jungle and fight the Aztecs. So they started being like, oh, we're going we're gonna to turn back. We're going to turn back. They started to rebel against, against Cortez. And when Cortez got word of that, you know what he did? He burned all the ships. And can you imagine those soldiers being like, oh, what? Why did you do that? And he's like, sorry, guys. We're not going back. We need to move forward. And they did. They had no other option. And they conquered the Aztecs. They were victorious. We're not going back. We're not going back. God might not call you to leave your homeland and your family and everything you know. Some of you might. He might. But one thing is certain. King Jesus wants us to follow him, to be with him. He wants us to be his ambassadors on this earth, his representatives, no matter where we are. Here in Winona or wherever he takes us, we, we represent him. We are his ambassadors of the new kingdom, of the kingdom of heaven, of the kingdom of God. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. And he's calling all of us to follow him and to do what he calls us to do and to use us like, he, like whatever he wants us to, to use us. The invitation is open. The invitation is open. Let's pray. Lord, we, we thank you. We thank you for, for calling us. For calling us to, to get out of that boat and follow you. Lord, thank you for coming. For being amongst us. For showing us the way. Lord, we need you. We need you. We know we don't deserve it. We know that we're not perfect, but you came anyway. 
and you love us. Lord, we want to be more and more like you. Transform us to be more and more like you, to your image and your likeness, Lord. Lord, thank you that we are part of your kingdom. We're a part of the kingdom of heaven, of the kingdom of God that is not of this earth. We pledge allegiance only to you, Lord Jesus. You are the king. You're the king of kings. Amen. Let's worship the king.
Christ alone. Amen. The king is here. Christ alone. He's the only one. Can you imagine not being able to learn about what we're learning? What we just heard that the, the fulfillment of God's promise arrived, that is here. Can you imagine not knowing, not being able to read what we just read in, our, in your own language? You know, there's still thousands of people groups all over the world that they haven't even heard the name of Jesus, let alone being able to have a Bible in their language. And there's been a, a huge push in the last few decades, last couple decades, to get the Word of God in every language all over the world. And you might be thinking at the end of the, of the message today, like, what in the world was Sammy doing in Slovakia? <laughs> of all places. Well, the Roma people of Eastern Slovakia have been praying for a thousand years for a thousand years to get the, the Bible translated in their own language, to be able to take the Word of God to all over the place, all over the world, where the Roma people that speak that language can understand, can read for themselves the beautiful Word of God. And through an, a connection with Reach Global and Roma Networks USA, I was invited to be a part after 15, a 15-year 15 labor of love to be a part of a celebration of the Romani Bible translated finally in their own language. And it's not only in Slovakia, but there's Roma people all over Europe, all over the world, millions of people will be able to be reached by the gospel, by the word of God, and the new covenant that Jesus fulfilled. This is the kingdom in action, the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. And we're developing a relationship, a partnership with Pastor Marek, who is Roma, who is actually was one of the translators of, of the Roma Bible, and uh, see how we can get involved in what God is doing with the Roma people in Europe. So stay tuned. <laughs> There's some announcements. Family Open Gym and Craft Night, January 14th, 6.30 to 8.30. Faster Care and Adoption, Thursday, January 18th, 5.30. Uh, there's going to be a panel of uh, social workers and law enforcement. If you want to know more about that, check it out. Uh, membership class, Made Alive, Saturday, January 20th, 9 a.m. to noon. Women's Ministry Teaching, January 9th, 6.30 p.m. Have a wonderful New Year 2024. We're not going back. We keep moving forward. Amen. God bless you.